Our next speaker, former Congressman Joseph DiGuardi. He is the only practicing accountant to ever have been elected to Congress. You can be sure the government doesn't want anybody there who can look at the books and go, oh my, what have you guys been doing? Uh, he, uh, he's served on the boards of several publicly traded companies, and he's the author of Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. There's a few books that he brought along that he wrote in the back, if you want to check them out at the petition tables. And we will have, uh, uh, and one of the rally prizes is his book. So without any further ado, former Congressman Joseph DeGuardi. Thank you very much. Now let me see, is this a young crowd or an old crowd? It's a mixed crowd. Is everybody happy? Well, I am happy to be here because you're talking my language. When I heard audit the Fed, I said, that's a rally I got to attend. Because when I went to Congress in 1984, believe it or not, I was shocked to find out that I was the only practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House, or Senate. What does that tell you? It tells you nobody's counting. Nobody cares to count. When I left in 1988, I was redistricted. I left behind 286 lawyers. Now, there are five, 435 House members, 100 senators. So you have 535, 535 and 100. Uh, 435 and 100. Boy, I'm a, an accountant. I better add these up right. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, 535 members of Congress. I left behind 286 lawyers. Imagine a place with 286 lawyers and no accountant. That's what you got in the Congress today. And that's why they're not adding up. Now, this is not an old story. I wrote this book in 1992. Do you see what I put on the cover of this book? You probably don't recognize it, but I have it in my hand, and I still have it in my pocket, but it doesn't work. That little card that I'm holding in this picture is a congressman or a congresswoman's voting card. It's the same size as your credit card. When I put that in, I said to myself, you know, every time I put this in, and I was there in the Reagan years, and we were worried about deficits. Imagine what we're worried about now when they're 10 times more. I, every time I put it in, I said, you know, we don't have enough money to cover these votes. I'm raising the national debt every time I put this card in the computer at the end of a row of seats. And it dawned on me, hey, this is not a voting card, it's a credit card because we're passing this cost on to the next generation. It's the most expensive credit card in the world, a congressman's voting card. And there it is on the front, credit line unlimited, expiration date never, built to future generations. Isn't that a sad story? Tough to clap for that one. Now, this book tells you the horrors of the budget system in the United States of America. And I put some pretty tough-sounding titles on it. For instance, Social Security, Chapter 5. You know what I called it? Congressional Child Abuse. Send the kids the bill. What did I call Chapter 4? Because of the debt in those times. Imagine the debt now compared to then. Obama said we're going to add 10 trillion dollars more in the next 10 years to the 10 trillion we've already bonded. At the least, the bonded debt is going to be 20 trillion dollars. Now that's a huge amount of money, but you know what the big problem is? The interest on that debt. Interest now is low. In 10 years, interest is going to be much higher because of the inflation we're creating because the Fed now, and you're worried about the Federal Reserve System, is pushing money out there like you can't believe, and you're right. They're not audited. So I do congratulate Congressman Paul and Senator Sanders for their bills to audit the Fed. But we got to do it the right way. But let's not get tricked by nice words like audit the Fed. Because if you don't know what that means, you could be seduced into doing the wrong thing. And let me tell you why. Are you ready to hear the real answers? Are you ready to hear from a certified public accountant who served 22 years in the world's largest accounting firm before he went to Congress? Are you ready to hear the truth? And I just gave it to them seven weeks ago. I was invited in Washington to testify about the future fiscal unsustainability of the United States of America if we stay on this track where we're becoming a hostage to Chinese money 
and Saudi Arabian oil. Should we be a hostage to countries who don't share our values? Should we? Absolutely not. But more of it's coming. Because if we don't keep borrowing from China, at least in the short run, we're not going to keep everybody in a job, and we're not going to keep everybody in their homes. You know why? We don't have any money left. We ran out of money. That's why the Federal Reserve now is printing more money. And until we have an audit, we don't even know what they're printing, right? But since you don't have any accountants in Congress anymore, any real ones, nobody is asking these questions. Now let me show you something. Have you ever seen this book? This is the financial report of the United States government. Do you know this exists? You probably don't. This is the 2008 report. The fiscal year was September 30th, 2008. Now, guess where this started? This started with me. Because when I went to Congress, they didn't have a report for the people, for the United States of America. My firm, my old firm, Arthur Anderson, worked five years to come up with the report, did it for nothing after we did the audit of New York City because we were hired by the Secretary of Treasury. You remember the bankruptcy in New York City, 1975? You remember Big Mac? Well, that was my firm that was called in to put together the books for New York City. We had a leader in those days, head of the firm, who said, you know what? This is unbelievable that we had to do all this work just to get a financial statement for New York City. We should now go ahead even though they're not paying for us, and do it for the United States of America. Let's piece together all these different entities and come up with the consolidated financial statements of the United States of America. The firm did it for nothing, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. In 1980, they gave it to the U.S. Treasury, and the Treasury printed it as a prototype. Now it's put out annually, okay? But guess what? And this is what I testified. Do you want to hear my testimony? Yes. Do you have my card in your hand? I asked them to hand out my card to everybody here. Do you have it? Show it to me. No, that's the book. Where's my card? There, I see them. Does everybody have this card? Where are the rest of the cards, everybody? Where are those young people in the back? Oh, who's got them? All right, pass them out here. Because I want you to see my website Guess what I called my foundation? Truth in government. You like that? Truth in government. And here it is, truthingovernment.com. I want you to go to that website, and I want you to see the video of my testimony seven weeks ago in Washington. And guess what I told these guys, seven weeks, and women, there were 20 people on that, and guess what I told them? Because I brought the original statements from 1975 that a certified public accounting firm prepared. And guess what they took off when the Treasury took over this statement? They took off the liability for Social Security. And now the liability for Medicare is even bigger. And it's still not here. Guess what the liability for Social Security and Medicare is today? You may have seen it in the New York Times, Pete Peterson Foundation, $53 trillion. $53 trillion and it's not on the books of the United States of America. Can you imagine that? Why? Look at, who's got my brochure? Open up the brochure to the middle, to the very middle. Look at the article in the very middle that I wrote for the National Law Journal. What's the title? Cooking the Nation's Books. This article uncovers all the gimmicks. It tells you it's all off the books. You remember Enron Corporation? Enron? It doesn't exist anymore. Why doesn't it exist anymore? Because they played accounting games. They created what they call SPEs, special purpose entities. They fooled the accountants, they fooled the people, and they put the debt and losses off the books and off the audit so you didn't know how bad Enron was until it was ready to go bankrupt. Guess what is happening today in Washington? The same thing! That's why I wrote the article. They got special purpose entities. Guess what they called in Washington? And one of them, by the way, is the Fed, but they got 29 more. Government-sponsored enterprises. Let me give you a few. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Farm Credit System, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the Post Office, and 25 more. These are off the budget. But when they have losses and they need a bailout, like Fannie Mae just did, 
they raise a tre debt through treasury bills, and they don't put it on the books. Now, is this fraud? Absolutely. If you were a publicly traded corporation, and you were an officer on the board of that company, because the SEC, doesn't, the Securities and Exchange Commission, doesn't allow you to use the accounting that the federal government uses, but if you try to use it to sell stock on the exchange, you're indicted for securities fraud, and you're arrested and put in jail for sure. But congressmen are running around using nice words like accountability, transparency, governance, all these nice words, and they don't know what they mean. How can you have accountability when you don't have a good accounting? How can you have accountability when you don't have an audit? And how can you have accountability, real accountability, when you don't bring in outside auditors? We don't want to control it. Now, this is the only disagreement. I'm going to talk to Ron Paul and Senator Sanders. We've got to change their bill. Because he's calling for the Comptroller General, the inside guy, to do the audit. Now, we know he's a decent guy, but he gets his salary. The, control, the Comptroller General is part of the GAO, Government Accountability Office. Guess who funds that? Congress. Congress doesn't want to tell you the truth. Why should we have them do the audit? Let's call the outside auditors in to do a real audit, right? Now, I have a good example of this. 1994, well, it was 1998 that I called for an audit of the U.S. House of Representatives. Imagine the People's House. Every chair in that house represents 600,000 Americans, and the books were in shambles. I said to the speaker, you need to call an audit. It didn't happen until the Republicans gained control. 1994, they brought in Price Waterhouse. What did Price Waterhouse say after auditing for a year? We cannot give you a clean opinion because the books are unauditable. It took two years to get a clean audit for the House of Representatives. Now, if the legislative branch of government can't keep a set of books, how are we going to expect the uh, Defense Department and all these other departments to keep a set of books? That's the problem. And guess what you have here? In the front of this book, you have an opinion that is signed by the Comptroller General. And guess what it says? I cannot give you a clean opinion. This is 2008. And 20 years they've been doing this. Why can't he give you a clean opinion? Because he says that 53% of the accounting information that goes in, and now these are all the government agencies, departments, 53%, mainly the Department of Defense, don't have books that they can audit. Can you imagine this? They're asking you for taxes every year. I'm not telling you 20 years ago. This says 2008. If you read the front of this, you'll see that the Comptroller General says he cannot sign it. The Treasury Secretary signed it. He could not sign it without saying that I can't give you a clean opinion because the books of the Defense Department are still unauditable. In other words, there's no audit trail. In other words, money is being wasted. In other words, money is going through the cracks. And we still don't know how much, because this is not a priority. The priority is everything else. Let's spend money on anything, but let's not spend money on auditors. That's not too important. Don't you want to know the real truth? You should be yelling and screaming about this, that you want a good audit, and you certainly want the Fed to be audited, right? Yeah. But you don't want the Fed to be audited by the people who are spending the money. You want the Fed to be audited by outside certified public yeah. account. Now, should I bring that message to Ron Paul? Yeah. I'm going to tell him I'm calling him on your behalf, that you told me to call him because we're supporting, and I know Ron, we're supporting his bill, but we want to see it passed in the way it should be passed. Now, why is this all important to us as Americans today? And I said this at the end of my testimony. Who's going to watch my testimony? It's the first thing that's on that little uh, website. And there's many other speeches you'll see as well. And if you want my book, and by the way, I do have 100 copies of my book in the back. You know, I give these away to students, because mainly in high school and college, because it's their money that we're spending. But it costs money to print this stuff. 
Now, if you can't afford it, even if you give a buck, okay, but if you can give 10 bucks, you should have a copy of that book, okay? Uh, whatever you can afford, I'm not going to look into your pocket, but you should have a copy of that book you came here. But if you can afford minimum 10, do it so I can make more and give to the students. That's what it's about. No one is making any money on this. But why did I go down there? And you're going to like the way I take this group on. And I told them to their face. I said, my bill, do you have the cover of my book, my booklet? Look at the little booklet. You see me? That bill, H.R. 40, what is it, 644? That bill passed in 1990, just after I left Congress. And I thought about the idea of bringing a chief financial officer to the United States government. Isn't that a nice idea? Every corporation has one. The United States of America didn't have one. They had a treasury secretary. They had an OMB director, Office of Management Budget. They had a CBO, Congressional Budget Office. They had all kinds of cockamamie auditors in the Defense Department. But they didn't have someone who could make sense of numbers. And that has to be a trained, certified public accountant. It was my bill that brought it. But guess what they did? Always compromising, dumbing down so the people don't get the real thing. They put the CFO in the Treasury Department when I told them to set up a separate group, apart from everything, independent, so that the numbers would not be controlled by politicians. Once you put the CFO under the Secretary of Treasury, you're, then he's a hostage to what the President wants. And that then depends who's in the White House. That's not right. You want an independent Chief Financial Officer. We still have to do that, but at least we have a CFO. That was my bill. Now, let's go forward. What is the biggest problem we face today? If we keep borrowing, and you only know the borrowing that they tell you, because right now, do you know what the debt is right now on the books of the United States? The Treasury bills we've sold, the Treasury bonds, the Treasury notes. Let me give you the number. The number at the end of this fiscal year was 9.3 trillion, but it's already over 10 trillion because of the stimulus and all the things that we've done. So that's the bonded debt. That doesn't include the $53 trillion. That's not even on this. And yet the baby boomers now are gonna come down the track and they want their benefits. Why is this a danger? Because 20, 30 years ago, more people were working than people retired. But in 10 or 20 years from now, there'll be more people retired than working. And who's going to pay for the Social Security since they already took it out of the fund? Did you know that there's no lockbox? Did you know that there's no trust fund? They already took $4 trillion of money that we paid in in payroll taxes, FICA taxes, and they spent it already. So now when the baby boomers come, we got to find that money. Otherwise, what are they going to tell them? We can't give you your benefits. There'll be a, a, a civil war in America, won't they? After every politician was elected, Look at my testimony because I told it to this group. Don't tell me you can't put that liability on the books because there's been an exchange of political capital here, moral capital here. People have voted for people who said there was a lockbox and a trust fund and you lied to them. And don't lie twice by now not putting the liability on the books. Did I say the right thing? Uh -huh. When you get that speech of mine, make sure you send it to all your friends. Forward it. Let them see it. America is not getting the right information. A lot of people don't like to hear from accountants. They think we're boring. No, maybe I was the exception. I got elected. By the way, do you remember my second race for Congress? Guess who I had to beat in order to stay in Congress for the second term? I'm not a partisan guy, but I was a uh, conservative, fiscal conservative Republican in a liberal Democratic district, the lower part of Westchester County. All right, so guess who moved from West, the village to take me on. I had a beater, and she was one of the biggest spenders. Bella Rabzer, do you remember? The one with the hat? That was my second race. Let me tell you, that was a learning experience for me, because she took off the hat and she looked like everybody's grandmother. Now I had to be very nice to her. Not like Lazio, who walked over to Clinton and started a war. You gotta be very nice when you're dealing with an, elder, an older woman, especially one that looks like your grandmother but she was tough and clever, and I had to be on my toes at all times. And Roger Ailes, who was my media guy back in those times, said, Joe, I don't care what you do. I don't care what she says. Your face better be smiling every time. They'll call you Genghis Khan if you say the wrong thing. <laughs> in any case, 
By the way, another little trivia. You know my name, Dio Guardi, right? Do you know that my daughter is the fourth judge on American Idol? Kara. Yes. That little girl was raised in New Rochelle. Our family originally comes from the Bronx. She was a singer. So if you can't pronounce my name when you tune on Fox, there it is. <laughs> so what's the problem? Let me end with this. But play the video so you get the whole thing. The problem is this. Not only are we running out of money, not only do we have increasing debts now or increasing obligations for Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, not only is the working population shrinking, but since we've run out of our own money, we're borrowing more from China. Our oil is still not what it should be, domestic consumption. So we have to now still be a hostage to Mideastern Saudi Arabian oil. Now, if we keep borrowing, then we're going to then jeopardize the freedoms, the independence, the democracy that made this country so great. Let me give you a for instance. You remember Hillary Clinton just went to China? Every time a Secretary of State went to China, we always mentioned something about Tibet or something about Tiananmen Square. Did you hear a peep out of her for this? No, because we're afraid that China may not give us the money we need in the short term. So already we're seeing that if we're going to become a hostage to other nations, especially those who don't share our values, then we may be changing little by little the human rights that this country stands for, the freedoms that this country stands for, the opportunity that this country stands for. Hey, my father came here in 1929. He was 15. He didn't speak a word of English. In a depression, he was shining shoes in Harlem. Then he had a vegetable stand on 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. And then when I was born in 1940, it was a grocery store in the South Bronx. We moved to Westchester when I was 16. And I had to get a job in a country club. My old man was tough. Everybody had to work. But I don't want to see people work that hard. But my father didn't come here for a government program. He came here for opportunity, right? Like your parents did. And we got to continue this as the greatest opportunity society ever, don't we? Yeah. We're not going to do it if we're a hostage to other countries for things that we need. This is your obligation. So going forward, one of the things that I recommended for the next financial statement of the United States of America is a new statement to be put inside. Statement on fiscal sustainability. What does that mean? You know, numbers, if you understand numbers, they can talk to you. They start to point to what's going on. Bankruptcy does not happen overnight. There are things that you can pick up to see the trend, and then you could see what's coming. Just like we're now seeing, fi finally, the debt is getting too high and we're worried, and things are off the books and we're even more worried. So we need to send a signal to the people, especially the next generation, that there are things we have to worry about. So what I said is we gotta now print a statement that not only shows us the national debt, but shows us what portion of that debt comes from China and Japan, right? And so that over a period of time, we'll begin to see that this is going up and this is the danger side. Another thing we have to do, we spend a lot on defense, don't we? Does all that money stay here? No, the war in Iraq, I'll bet you we don't get reimbursed a dime for all that money. And by the way, all that money that Bush spent, and I'm a Republican, he didn't put it in the budget. This was off budget stuff. Obama's claiming now he's like a good accountant because he's putting it on the budget, but he can get away with it now because he's got so much else. The numbers are in the trillions, and he's saying, I'm accountability, Mr. Accountability, Bush wasn't. But he's doing a lot more than just that. The point is, how much can we spend as a nation around the world before we begin to understand that as a percentage of our gross domestic product, it's getting too high and it's gonna make us less competitive. We're in a global economy. We gotta compete now against China and Japan and Germany and South America. And we gotta start exporting some stuff too. And thank God we know we have the technological edge. Nobody's better than we are on technology. That's where Google came from and Microsoft. But guess what they wanna do? They want to now cut R&D expenses. You can't do that because that's how we became 
better than everybody else. That's how we became more productive. That's how we eliminated all the waste in the past, and that's why the deficits in the past didn't hurt us. Because two people we made into three and four. When you give people the right tools, the computers, you make them more than their, their, the sum of their total. You know that. Two people become three, four, five, and six. So we can't cut R&D. That's another number I want to see on this statement. What percentage of our GDP is being spent on R&D? What percentage on defense? And then let's compare it to the G20, the other developed nations. What percentage are they spending on GDP? Let's make some comparisons. Accountants do that. You need to know how can you vote without this information. Don't you want to have that information? Louder, louder. I know you want that information. Unfortunately, not enough people are asking for it, and you have to start writing. Now, what am I going to ask you to do? Don't go home and fall asleep, please. And I know you're not that type. You wouldn't be here. You need to write your congressman or woman, your representative, no matter where you are, and your two senators. Say, you know what? I heard this guy, Joe DiAguardi. And by the way, I've sent my book to every member of Congress. They know who I am. When they see me, they walk the other way. Believe me. Because they don't have answers. Now, say, I just heard this guy, DiAguardi. And he made sense to me. And here is his website. And he has this book, Unaccountable Congress. I need for you to tell me, is it true that we have $53 trillion off the books? Is it true that the Fed is one of these special purpose entities that is not in the budget? And do you have a problem with the bill that Ron Paul put in? Is it true that the accounting system of the United States of America, the cash basis, is like the one Enron? It's like the one Enron. See, I'm still a congressman at heart. I can't stop talking. You're right. <laughs> but I think you've heard enough from me. But is it true that the books of the United States are like Enron, that we have all these things off the books? Look at my book. Every chapter has a dynamite title to it. You can, don't have to read the whole thing to get the message. And quote from it, send it to your representative, your two senators, and say, I want you to tell me to my face, write me back, to tell me that this is not true. And if it is true, why aren't you doing what Congressman Diaguardi suggested and make the accounting system like the one you imposed on the people through the SEC? There should be no double standards, correct? God bless you all. If you want a copy of the book, go back there and get it. And don't forget to email me. You got my card. Thank you. And the name of the book is Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. He'll be in the back of the crowd, and I think there's a few people circulating the books, uh, and you can get one. Uh, you know, donate a little money to his, to his cause, his foundation, uh, and you should be able to get a book.